Doc Talk, brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hi there and welcome to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here from the College of Veterinary Medicine. I'm joined today by Dr. Casey Olson, who is a ruminant nutritionist over in the Animal Science and, and Industries Department, and he's a professor here at Kansas State University. And thanks for coming. Oh, you bet, Dan. Always a pleasure. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. It's always a topic that's, you know, something that we're interested in and, and something that really hits the bottom line of the producers. And today, with the drought and, and different things, there's probably nothing much more important than, to a lot of cattlemen than how we're going to get these cows fed through the winter. I'd agree. I mean, even in the best of winters, the time between the first of the year and roughly the first of May is uh, where we spend 90% of our nutrition dollar. And in this year, going into a winter where we're short with forage following a drought that many have called uh, the worst drought in 500 years here in the Flint Hills, uh, we're up against the wall. Now, I've been out driving countryside and, and just seeing the, you know, some of these pastures look like the top of this countertop. And, and you just wonder, how are we going to, you know, get through this? What are some of the things that go through your mind? Well, the first thing I think of when I see one of those pool table pastures is that uh, most of the producers, unfortunately, are, are thinking about stocking grazable forages for a six to seven month grazing season only. And then they're relying on, on harvested forages to get them through the winter. Uh, it's a fact, folks, that uh, those harvested forages carry a significant price tag. And it's very difficult to get a, a high input, uh, low capital return kind of business like a cow-calf enterprise to cash flow efficiently when harvested forages have to be relied on for half of the year. So, not, yeah, so if you're, if you're buying it and hauling then, um, really increase our cost. Yeah, it's sort of like beef cow welfare. Uh, you know, that cow was designed to harvest her own feed. Uh, she's, uh, she's designed to graze. And uh, when we uh, take her out of that grazing environment, we confine her for a period of time, uh, we, we set ourselves up for a pretty big feed bill. Yeah, when we talk about it in welfare, we're talking about the ability to exhibit normal behavior. Well, that's a, that's a good way to put it. I never <laughs> thought of it that way, but that makes a lot of sense, Doc. So, so um, what, what are, you know, w when we're heading into this winter time, what are some of the things that, the, what, give me the first thing that, that pops in your mind and you're going to look at in operation to, to design the program? Do you mind if we talk about this year specifically? No, we are rowdy and we're short of forty. I'd be, I'd be glad to. We're going to have to go to the break here in, in, in about sure. a little bit. But well, how would we, we get started to go ahead into the break? What are uh, we going to come back with? When we, uh, when we come back, folks, I'd like to talk to you about how we've managed this drought and how we're going to manage our winter feeding scenario at the K-State Cow Calf Unit. Well, again, great to have you on the show. We're going to discuss feeding the cows here in wintertime. We're going to talk about how Dr. Olson and his crew do it and handle it and there's what you said the the wrong way and the right way or the expensive way and the the affordable way that's right appreciate y'all joining us on the show we'll be right back after the break doc talk brought to you by kansas pork association Assisting producers and informing consumers. Hi there and welcome to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson, joined by Dr. Casey Olson. We're both from Kansas State University, and we're talking about drought management or feed winter feed management. And, and you all have a program that you use here when you manage the, the cow herd outside of Manhattan. That's a fact. We have a, we have a cow herd here that's for teaching and research. And in order to justify the existence of that cow herd, it has to cash flow. And uh, we're very cognizant of the, the money that we put into that cow herd every year. And we're, uh, we're a little bit peculiar in, in as much as we run to about 80% rented land. It means we have to put high emphasis on landowner relations and we have to take good care of those pastures that we lease. You bet. Now, we have a, a written drought management plan that we abide by just like the Ten Commandments. Um, it's based on accumulated rainfall at, any, uh, at several critical calendar dates during the year. It's also based on uh, forage growth on those critical calendar dates. 
Now, when we don't meet either one of those targets for a given date, we don't have enough rain, we don't have enough forage, we know that we have to start adjusting our stocking rate downward. Now, the whole goal of doing this, folks, is to make sure that we have enough winter grass to get us through uh, until green up in the spring. Now, we've had to make some significant cuts in stocking rate over the last four months. Some of the things that we did, we weaned early, about August 15th. Uh, we, uh, we got rid of some, uh, uh, some yearling heifers uh, to, uh, to bring our stocking rate down, and then we started to cut into that mature cow herd a little bit. Our inventory is down by about 60 ma mature cows as a result of this drought. But having that written plan and having a, a marketing plan attached to each one of those stocking rate reductions, we got through it in pretty decent financial shape. And we're left with uh, enough grass now to, uh, to accommodate our winter feeding program. <laughs> it's awesome stuff. So basically, during, throughout the year, you're taking moisture analysis of how much moisture is hitting these pastures, what that's going to contribute to growth within the pastures, and then from there, I think the strategy thing is something that really hit home with me. You know, the weaning early, looking at the mature cows and, and uh, making some, you can't, you can't just keep borrowing. No, you can't. Uh, and the <laughs> one person or the one entity you really can't borrow from is Mother Nature. If you, if you misuse your natural resources, folks, it's going to bite you. That's a simple fact of, of uh, resource management. May have to tell that to some of our uh, legislators. <laughs> oh, where are you going with this, Doc? <laughs> anyway, it's, um, you know, when, when we, you know, some of the things that, what happens when we get behind the eight ball? I mean, it may be something that will take us into the next break, but, you know, some, sometimes we are, we don't want to sell the cows and, and we, we don't have the grass. The, uh, the only option really at that point is for reduction of, of grazing pressure is destocking and feeding. Uh, and folks, that, that's probably the most expensive dr drought management uh, mitigation strategy that there is. Uh, but the one thing it will do is buy you time to, uh, to kind of think through the situation and discuss your options. Uh, many folks, for example, right now are, are using silage for the very first time because failed corn crops, failed sorghum crops are uh, finding their way into silage pits right now. Cool. After the break, we're going to discuss more about winter feeding management with Dr. Olson. Doc Talk, brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Welcome back to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson, joined by Dr. Casey Olson. And Dr. Olson is a ruminant nutritionist over in the Department of Animal Science here at Kansas State University, and he's a professor. But one of the things that, that you do that hit home with me in the previous segment is that you not only manage our, our teaching and, and research cow herd, commercial cow herd, but you have to manage it to, as if you were an outside operation. I mean, you're, you're balancing a budget and, and paying the bills. That's true. So, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to justify to a taxpayer that, uh, that, that we get to have a cow herd just to, just to play with and enjoy. Yeah, okay? exactly. It's our responsibility to make that cow herd profitable. You bet. And, and I think that's what makes your research so relevant and different from most and oh, and it's and, flattering. and it's awesome and 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 so let's talk about how how you go about feeding these cows through the winter sure. cow supplementation and, and things of that nature well as i've said before our winter feeding program is always based on dormant native range here in the flint hills of kansas uh, in most years not including this one uh, forage is typically very abundant, but of, of very low quality. Uh, just as an example, TDN value is usually in the low uh, 40s, and uh, protein value is usually below 5% crude protein. Now, the beef cow is our primary marketing vehicle in the United States for low quality forages. Just because forage quality is bad doesn't mean that we can't use it. Right. Uh, research that was done when I was a graduate student here at K-State, and even before that, uh, looked at, uh, you know, can we supply uh, nutrients in concentrated small amounts to the rumen that will enable a beef cow to use that low quality forage effectively? Uh, my predecessor, Dr. Bob Crockern, who is one of the greatest <laughs> ruminant nutritionists you of all time, right. uh, he figured out through a wonderful series of studies that if we can uh, deliver to a beef cow an average of about one pound of crude protein per day, 
that we can triple her intake of that low quality forage and we can double its energetic value. And it's really a trick of ruminal physiology. Okay, the rumen is short on nitrogen, we supply a little bit of nitrogen and that enables the ruminal microbes to, to tear down that forage and make a good diet out of it. So you're putting the bugs to work. You're gonna do, you're gonna use what, what the good Lord in Detroit designed these, these animals to do. And uh, coincidentally, folks, it, it happens to be a very cost-effective winter nutrition program. We're getting the most out of our leased pastures. Uh, we, are, uh, we are converting a, a, uh, uh, a forage resource of modest utility into something that's good enough to actually accrue body condition on a beef cow through the winter. And the, probably the most important thing is it allows us to stay in business. It does. When you start thinking about the, the cost saving, what are some of the higher end supplement protein programs running some people? Well, uh, there are a lot of uh, supplements out there that, that carry a very high price tag per unit of protein purchased. Um, a lot of self-fed supplements would fit into this category. Uh, when we return from the breakdown, I think we can maybe talk about delivery strategies for supplemental protein, and ways to make that even less expensive for a commercial operator. Doc Talk, brought to you by Kansas Pork Association, assisting producers and informing consumers. Welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Casey Olson. We're talking about uh, winter cow nutrition programs. And Casey, you want to talk to us about supplementation strategy, right? Yes. Okay. Now, in the previous segment, I mentioned that our magic formula here in the Flint Hills is to deliver an average of about one pound of crude protein to a cow per day during the winter, and that enables her to effectively use our, our low-quality native forage. There are some uh, tricks to make that even more effective. First off, the, the rumen does not require daily delivery of protein to be fully functional. Uh, we've discovered over time, again, through previous research here at Kansas State, that we can deliver protein on an alternate day basis, on a three-day per week basis, or even a two-day per week basis. Wow as long as we hit an average of one pound of protein per day. And when you talk about uh, cutting the number of trips down to the pasture to feed cows by half, you're really talking about significant savings in terms of equipment wear and tear, uh, fuel, and man hours. Oh, so, so which ones of these is, is probably the most common supplementation uh, delivery time? Well, um, what we like, at the cow-calf unit at Kansas State is a, is a delivery interval of between uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Monday and Thursday, depending on the group of cows and depending on their requirements, and, and also depending a little bit on the nature of the supplement. Now, that protein source that you choose, folks, should be uh, chiefly ruminally degradable. There are two types of protein, really, that we feed to beef cows. Uh, one form is ruminally degradable. The other is uh, degradable in the small intestine. Bypass. It's important bypass protein. Yep. It's important to uh, to choose a source that uh, that has a, a rich component of uh, ruminal degradability. Um, now, uh, in uh, this particular feed market, where all protein sources are are, are very expensive, I mean, when uh, when producers are out there merchandising their ingredients, when they're considering a purchase, uh, I encourage them to uh, to put those potential purchases on a dry matter basis. Uh, to remove water from the equation, and also to figure out then on a dry matter basis what your purchase price is per pound of protein in that ton of feed or that truckload of feed. That is your that is your path to uh, to least costing your uh, protein supplement. Well, I think it's some of the best information, one of the most relevant shows. We talked about nitrates uh, uh, this year and 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 that, but you know, we still have to feed these cows. Uh, we do. Uh, the nice thing about grazing through the winter, folks, on a, on a native forage source or a perennial forage source is that nitrates are generally not a worry. Um, now, for those of you out there that might be, uh, that might be considering using a, uh, a corn derivative as a winter forage source, uh, beware of those nitrates and beware of, of prussic acid. Test your forages, folks. Don't make a mistake that will cause you regret. Thank you for being on the show. You're welcome, Dan. It's always a pleasure. <laughs>
Dr. Casey Olson, Dr. Dan Thompson, and thank you for watching Doc Talk. Remember, we always recommend that you work with your local veterinarian and your local nutritionist. And if you want to learn more about what we do at Kansas State University or at the College of Veterinary Medicine, you can find us on the web at www.vet.ksu.edu. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson from Doc Talk. We sure enjoyed you watching the show today, and I'll see you down the road. <laughs>